Amen. Amen. It is so good to see you. I'm so glad that you're here today. We are continuing in our sermon series called This Is Us, and we're looking at the mission of Calvary and our uh, core values. And if that doesn't just excite you, I don't know what will. Uh, we believe that if we transfer these core values to all of us as individuals, we believe that we will make a difference here in Havasu and in Parker and around the world. Uh, if you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. And if you don't have a Bible with you today, you are invited to use one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you and turn to page 1120. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily at your home, please take one of our Bibles home with you, write your name in it, and make it your own. There is a caveat to that. We ask that you not use it as a leveler for your refrigerator. We want you to read it and apply it because we firmly believe if we read God's Word and apply His Word, He will change our lives. And, and it's not just the pastor standing up on the stage that says that. Many Many of you have experienced life change because you began to apply God's word to your life. In fact, if you've experienced life change by applying God's word, would you raise your hand? See, that's exciting. So if, if you're looking for hope, if you're looking for encouragement, begin to apply God's word and you're going to experience that. And, and if you're struggling today, if you're discouraged today, uh, if maybe today was like a last ditch effort on your faith journey, it is my prayer that you will find this core value of uncomfortable grace, encouraging, satisfying in your heart, and that it would bring peace and lasting hope to you. Now, our core values here at Calvary, we've been going over them. We have five of them. Uh, the first is relatable truth. We talked about applying God's word to our lives. Uh, transparent living, uh, that God desires us to be real, open, and honest about who we are and we allow other people to be real open and honest uh, about themselves as well. Last week, we talked about contagious celebration, that as followers of Jesus, if we really live out a joy-filled life, other people are going to be drawn to that. Next week, we'll talk about radical service. And today, as I've already mentioned, we're going to talk about uncomfortable grace. We believe here at Calvary that followers of Jesus give the same limitless grace that they have received from God. That's what uncomfortable grace is. That followers of Jesus give to other people the same limitless grace that they have already received from God. See, if you're a follower of Jesus, the grace that God has given to you isn't just for you, but it's for you to give to other people as well. And we're going to keep talking about that. But right now, I want us to look at Colossians 3, beginning at verse 12, because this passage of Scripture really best demonstrates what uncomfortable grace really looks like. Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13. Put on then... As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now look, we all love to receive grace, but it is often uncomfortable to give grace to other people. We give grace to those that we don't agree with. We give grace to those who maybe sin differently than us or maybe sin just like us. And, and if you grew up in church, you might be thinking to yourself that the two words uncomfortable and grace aren't supposed to go together. Uh, we're taught that grace is wonderful in the church, and it is. And, and we're taught that grace is comforting, and it is. We're taught that grace is amazing, and it is. 
And when we pray for other people, we often pray that they would experience the grace of God in their lives in an incredible way because God's grace is a good thing. But what is grace? What is God's grace? Now, that word grace can be a little bit confusing. I grew up, and when it was time to eat, we would say grace. We would all bow our heads, and we would say, Bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. That prayer was called grace. And after I surrendered my life to Jesus, after I received Christ as my Savior, anytime we would go out to eat as a group of believers in Jesus and we would eat, somebody would say, let's say the blessing. It's like the word changed from grace to the word blessing. The, the mealtime prayer was no longer called grace. That was for Catholics uh, to say. And now we would all say, who wants to say the blessing? It was a little bit confusing. So for the sake of the message today, grace is not referring to a mealtime prayer. Write this down in your life notes. God's grace is best described as God's goodness to those who deserve punishment. It's God's goodness to those who deserve punishment punishment, and I have news for you. I deserve to be punished for my sins. I deserve to be punished for my sins. I have lied. I have stolen. I have cheated. I have hated in my heart. I have sinned in my anger, and I have lost my temper. I have been arrogant. I have struggled with pride. I have wanted the spotlight on me and not necessarily on God. I have been selfish. I've been unfaithful to God. I've been unfaithful to my friends. I've been rude. I've been impatient with other people. I've carried grudges in my heart. I've not helped somebody when they needed it the most. I've not cared for my body, for my wife, or for my children the way that I ought to. I've rejected my creator. I've used the name of Jesus as a cuss word. I've openly mocked followers of Jesus for living for Jesus. I've not worshiped God the way that I should. I've not lived for God the way that I should. I've not loved others the way that I should. I'm a sinner. Raise your hand if you know somebody guilty of doing the, most of those things that I just mentioned. Raise your hand if it's the person in front of you, not you. <laughs> and, and the reality is, I deserve to be punished for my sin. In Ezekiel 18.4, God was speaking and he said, all people are mine to judge both parents and children alike. And this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. See, all people belong to God. That's you and that's me. And since we belong to him, he gets to make the rules. And in his rules, he says the person who sins is going to die. The punishment that I deserve because of my rebellion against God is death. And not only do I deserve to die physically, but I deserve to be punished by experiencing spiritual death. Again, why? Because God makes the rules and I'm not God. See, I deserve to suffer in hell for all eternity. I deserve to be tormented by a flame that never consumes what it burns, an everlasting flame that will never go out. That is what I deserve. And don't be mad at me, but so do you. That is what you deserve as well. Let that sink in for just a minute. You deserve to be punished for your sins. And I know that's not like a politically correct statement. And I recognize that one of you or several of you may want to run for a safe zone right now to find that safe place, but that's what God says about you and I. And when you accept 
the weight of that statement that's when you can best understand how life-changing the grace of God really is. That you can experience God's goodness toward you. You can experience God's grace towards you when you can embrace the weight of that statement that you and I deserve to be punished for our sins. See, God's justice, because he's just, a punishment must be paid. And God's love chooses to pay the punishment himself. See, God's goodness is not punishing us by giving us what we deserve. So Jesus chose to willingly pay that death penalty. Jesus chose to become a person, to live on this earth, to live a sinless life and accept our punishment of death on his shoulders. When he hung on the cross, when he was nailed to the cross, all the weight of the sin of the world, the punishment of the sin of you and I was placed on Jesus because God is a just God, but he's also a loving God. And Jesus said, I will pay the penalty for them. So then the price was paid. The debt was satisfied. The punishment was satisfied. And the relationship between God and people was redeemed. And that is why we sing about grace. That is why we sing about God's goodness. Because it's life-changing. We recognize that when we surrender our lives to Jesus, the penalty, the punishment for, the, for our sin is erased and it's gone. And it's no longer a wall of hostility between God and us. Rather, we have the ability to know our creator in a personal, intimate way. And, and that's the why we sing the words to the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but... So if every morning you wake up and you look in the mirror and you're haunted by sins of your past, if you feel like the, the, your sin is weighing you down, if you feel like you're just a failure in life, if you think that God will never forgive you for something that you have done, I want you to ask yourself honestly, which one of your sins will God not forgive? Which one of your sins will God not forgive? Which of, of your sins do you think God is holding against you? Have you done something to somebody else and it damaged them in such a way you think that God will not forgive you for it? Do you wake up every day with regret and with shame and you think about what you've done? Do you go through pill after pill or bottle after bottle trying to forget the pain that you caused? I want you to know something. God has something better for you and it's called freedom. You don't have to be weighed down by the sin of your past. God's goodness towards you, God's grace towards you cannot fail. It's demonstrated by Jesus giving up his life on the cross and it cannot be watered down and it cannot be explained away. Jesus has set you free from your sin. And that means he has set you free from shame. He has set you free from fear. He has set you free from doubt, from insecurities about your past mistakes. He has set you free from the sin of your past. So stop chaining yourself down by the weight of regret and the weight of your sin and the weight of shame. Walk in freedom and live in uncomfortable grace. And as you live out God's uncomfortable grace, as you live in God's uncomfortable grace in your own life, I want to encourage you to ask yourself this, 
do you allow others space to fail? Do you allow others space to fail? Do you criticize them when they mess up? Do you harp on people around you when they make poor choices? Do you whisper about the teenage girl that got pregnant? Do you whisper about the mother or the father that drinks too much? Do you whisper about the parent losing their temper in the grocery store? I've been there before. Do you gossip about your neighbor's choice of swimwear? The 75 year old who wears pasties? Do you say, hey, she's 75, she should not be wearing pasties? Honestly, we probably, none of us should be wearing pasties. <laughs> but, but weren't you once like that? Didn't you once make bad decisions? Didn't you once make poor choices? Haven't you made horrible mistakes? Didn't you once live as a sinner without any hope? And if, it, if it's true, then give people space to fail around you without judging them. You once made similar choices. They may not have smelled like yours, right? Their sin may smell differently, but you still were a sinner and you still deserve death. So give other people space to fail. See, you were made new, but maybe they've not been made new yet. You were cleansed from your past mistakes. So why limit God's grace only to you? Why not demonstrate God's grace in such a way that the same grace he applies to you, you apply to everybody else? If God has forgiven you for every one of your sins, if God doesn't hold any of your sins against you, then don't hold people's sins against them either. Forgive Make allowance for their faults. See, followers of Jesus ought to so, show so much grace that everybody around us gets a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance and a sixth chance. That's how we ought to live as followers of Jesus. I camped out with some friends this past week in Zion National Park in Utah. And it was awesome and it was great and amazing. And one of the things that we all seemed to enjoy was the campfire. Like it's, I love watching the flames of, the, of a campfire. I love feeling the warmth, but there's one thing I did not like about the campfire and that was the smoke. I hated the smoke from the fire. It got in my eyes, it got in my hair, it got in my clothing. The wind blew it just right into my tent. Like it, just the smell of the campfire is cool at the campsite. But on Thursday, we were traveling home and my hair still smelled like campfire. My skin still smelled like campfire. It was in my nostrils. I, I couldn't get away from the smell of the campfire smoke. It was in my clothes and my beard and my hat. It was in my underwear. It was everywhere. And I knew that when I got home in order to feel clean, I had to do more than just change my clothes. I had to take a shower and then I had to put on clean clothes. It wouldn't have made any sense if I wanted the stench of the campfire to leave me if I just changed my clothes because the smoky odor on my skin would still be there. I wouldn't feel clean and I wouldn't be clean. Putting on fresh clothes would not have helped. I had to get washed. And I think sometimes, sometimes we're all guilty of doing something similar when it comes to a relationship with God. Sometimes people try to do something similar to feel better in their lives. They start attending church. Uh, they begin doing nice things to other people but they've never been washed by God's grace personally. They've never experienced God's grace personally in their lives. 
And if you would like to receive forgiveness for your sins, for all of your sins, for even the one that you don't think God will forgive you for, I will tell you right now, yes, that's what he does. He forgives, he restores, he redeems. He wants to have a relationship with you. And if you want to begin a relationship with God, if, if you want to start over and receive that second chance in life, I invite you to surrender your life into God's hands and receive Jesus as your Savior. Now, it will look something like this, but there's, not a, there, there's definitely not a only way to do it. I, when I gave my life to Jesus, I thank God for creating me, and, and I admit to God that I had sinned. And you don't have to go through all the specifics of your sin. Saying that you're a sinner is enough. And tell God that you know that you deserve punishment. And you're thankful that Jesus paid the punishment for you on your behalf. And then simply surrender your life to God. Give up. Tell God you can't do it anymore. Invite Jesus to change your life and receive him. Be forgiven and know what it's like to live a life not weighed down by guilt and not weighed down by hopelessness. Our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of the last song. They would love to talk to you about what a relationship with God can look like and how to start that. But very quickly, I just wanna quote Romans 10, 9. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead. What does that tell us? We have a God that defeats death. We have a God that gives life that breathes life. In fact, he's the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. He holds the keys of life and death in his hands. And he can give you life, he can give you hope if you surrender your life to Jesus, receive him as your savior, you will be changed forever. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you recognize that grace can really be uncomfortable. So get dressed in it today. Grace can really be uncomfortable. It actually can be awkward to forgive like God forgives. It can be. It can make other people uncomfortable as well. Yet that is a value that we have chosen to embrace here at Calvary. Regardless of your past, you're welcome here at Calvary. Regardless of your future, you're welcome here at Calvary. There are some who sit in service after service and continue to reject Jesus' work in their lives. Guess what? You are welcome here. We're so glad that you're here and we hope and pray you will continue to come back because we believe one day you're gonna surrender your life to Jesus because his grace is amazing and it's powerful and it's wonderful and it's cleansing and giving uncomfortable grace to other people is so amazing. Once you start doing it, you can't stop doing it. Showing grace to other people the same way God shows it to you, it's kind of contagious. It kind of has a ripple effect in our community. Going back to verse 12, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. That's what the New Living Translation says. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive other people. We all want to be, have other people demonstrate tenderhearted mercy to us, but it can be a little bit uncomfortable to show it to the people around us that we know they've done some tough things. 
they've done some rough things. They've done things that they should be in prison for for the rest of their lives. Yet, we can't gloss over this passage of Scripture. We must forgive others because Christ has forgiven us. That's awkward. That's uncomfortable. Yet that is the calling of followers of Jesus. We live out our faith, whether it makes people comfortable or not. So put on God's clothing. Put on those new clothes, those fresh smelling clothes of kindness and watch your life change. Put on tenderhearted compassion and demonstrate it to other people around you and watch your life change. Watch God unlock that smile. Watch God unlock that deep joy in your heart as you begin to put on the clothes of compassion and understanding and forgiveness. And God will do a work in your heart that is breathtaking, that is amazing, and that is awesome. We will continue to change the world around us if one of our core values is uncomfortable grace, showing grace in the lives of to the lives of other people, the same limitless grace that we have received from God, we demonstrate to others. Don't be afraid to demonstrate it and to show it. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for uncomfortable grace. Thank you for the fact that while I was yet a sinner, Jesus died for me. I thank you for the hope that I have in Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. And now, Lord, we want to ask that you would be at work in the hearts of those people here that maybe have not yet surrendered their lives to you. Lord, we invite you to work in their hearts, open up their minds, open up their eyes, let them see the truth that Jesus paid the punishment for their sins. And help them, even now as I pray, to admit the truth and surrender their lives to you. Father, thank you for your love for us and thank you for changing us. Continue to do that as we celebrate communion together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.